Welcome to a special episode of Beyond the Roundup. Today we'll be discussing an emerging story where the NIH COVID-19 Treatment Guidelines Panel has updated their stance on ivermectin after having invited top ivermectin researchers to discuss the evidence of efficacy to date. Now, we'll talk about what was covered and we'll discuss what comes next. From Trial Site News, I'm Adrian, and this episode starts now. So, just over a week ago, the National Institutes of Health, or the NIH, invited the Frontline COVID-19 Critical Care Alliance, or the FLCCC, to present to this APEX National Research Agency's COVID-19 Treatment Guidelines panel. Now, the panel, which is the most influential of any such group worldwide, is finally taking the time to review the ivermectin situation. Of course, such a meeting wouldn't be possible if it were not for the dedicated, committed, and relentless efforts of the physician researchers' embrace of a story that we have been chronicling since April. Now, the FLCCC, led by Dr. Pierre Corey and Dr. Paul Merrick, along with prominent British researcher Dr. Andrew Hill, affiliated with the University of Liverpool in the UK, presented their respective meta-analysis findings. Now, during the meeting, the FLCCC and Dr. Hill initiated a discussion with the panel concerning the numerous clinical trial data accumulated to date. The team's meta-analysis, representing what is now 18 randomized controlled trials that covers over 2,100 patients. The research points to benefits of ivermectin in prophylaxis, early treatment, and even late-stage advantages. The physician researchers suggested that in the aggregate, there is sufficient data to substantiate enough to reliably assess clinical efficacy. Now, the reason why this meeting with the NIH's COVID-19 Treatment Guidelines panel is so important, to be frank, is that this group wields the power to influence how patients are treated worldwide. Each and every update to the guidelines are watched by all relevant research authorities. Thus, this is the most influential group in the world when it comes to evaluating and either approving or rejecting a particular approach when dealing with COVID-19. That is how important this meeting was. Now, the NIH established the COVID-19 treatment guidelines to inform clinicians how to care for COVID-19 patients. It is considered a critically important initiative, as on one hand, speed is of the essence, as here in the USA, over 370,000 people have died due to this virus, and that figure approaches 2 million worldwide. And on the other hand, desperate situations cannot force compromised decision-making. And so, the panel must make informed decisions based on solid scientific evidence. And this can and does take time. Additionally, a majority of the panel members must also endorse a recommendation before any change to the guidelines can take place. So, what has the FLCCC found thus far? Well, based on the data analyzed from the 18 randomized controlled trials and 2,100 patients, the team articulated that the results demonstrated that ivermectin produces faster viral clearance, faster time to hospital discharge, faster time to clinical recovery, and a 75% reduction in mortality rates. Following the hearing, Dr. Pierre Corey, FLCCC's president, stated that in order to save thousands who will die while waiting for their turn to receive the vaccine, it is imperative that treatment guidelines issued by the NIH over four months ago be updated to reflect the strength of the data for ivermectin in prophylaxis, early treatment, and late-stage disease. So now let's talk about what the results were from the meeting. Perhaps it was the fact that the Frontline COVID-19 Critical Care Alliance met with the COVID-19 Treatment Guidelines panel, but it appears that the NIH has softened its stance on ivermectin. On Thursday, January 14th, the NIH published an update titled The COVID-19 Treatment Guidelines Panel's Statement on the Use of Ivermectin for the Treatment of COVID-19, which is meant to offer interim guidance as the panel formally updates their treatment guidelines. 
The NIH changed the recommendation from against the use of ivermectin for the treatment of COVID-19, with the exception of clinical trials, to not recommending either for or against the use of the drug for the treatment of COVID-19. Now, something worth noting here. We spoke with the FLCCC, and we were told that they were informed at the meeting with the NIH that the guidelines would be updated sometime by February. So, why publish this statement almost immediately after the FLCCC meeting? According to some physician commenters, such as the whiteboard doctor, they suggest that the NIH is offering both physicians and patients the opportunity to consider the treatment. Providers that have confidence in the efficacy of COVID-19 as a treatment, and for that matter, patients that seek the drug, are suggesting that this interpretation opens the door for more off-label prescribing. Meanwhile, the FLCCC, based on its current meta-analysis, continues the pursuit of the ivermectin initiative, which includes collaborating with a group with a comprehensive ivermectin meta-analysis in the UK, led by Dr. Andrew Hill. Now, the NIH panel is clear that more trial data from properly designed trials is of paramount importance. Yet, other treatments authorized for emergency use by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, such as convalescent plasma or monoclonal antibodies, appear to involve less positive data than ivermectin. After all, ivermectin is already approved by the FDA and has been in use to fight various parasites for decades. So going forward, one key question is dosage, which large, well-designed trials will address. And the FLCCC's recent manuscripts have also passed a rigorous peer review with frontiers in pharmacology. Now, while all of this was going on, Dr. Pierre Corey engaged with radio talk show host Hugh Hewitt to discuss the FLCCC research. Dr. Corey believes that global research agencies and regulators are only a few months away from arriving at what will represent the logical outcome based on mounting data, which would be a positive decision to support the use of ivermectin, along with other mission-critical efforts, including a vaccination. Take a listen. Be skeptical but look at the data. You will be surprised. This data is completely different than the data for any other therapeutic. Hydroxychloroquine doesn't even come close. And let's remind ourselves, hydroxychloroquine is adopted without data. It was only after the trials come out that we ended up abandoning it, but it was, it was adopted widely. Ivermectin is the opposite. We're not adopting it, and the mountains of data are accumulating for it uh, is really now insurmountable. I mean, you have to look at the data. Now, to hear the complete interview of Dr. Pierre Corey by Hugh Hewitt, we provided a link in the description below. And so, to sum all of this up, the NIH COVID-19 Treatment Guidelines Panel Update provides both a disappointing and potentially positive interpretation for those who have been following the meta-analysis. Now, while the NIH's move evidences an acknowledgement that a number of studies, some of which have been published in peer-reviewed journals, showcase data that could be construed as positive, as an example, shorter time to resolution of disease symptoms associated with COVID-19, bigger reductions in inflammatory markers, and shorter time to viral clearance or lower mortality rates. They also point out that some clinical studies are interpreted as not showing benefits associated with the drug. At the core of the NIH's cautious position are elements the panel cites, which are a majority of sample sizes are considered small, Dosage regimens are not harmonized. Some of the studies were open, hence no blinding. Combinations with other medications, such as doxycycline, confounded evaluation of actual efficacy and safety of the drug, and study outcome measures were at times not well defined. Consequently, the NIH cannot, from their vantage point, promulgate a positive recommendation in regards to ivermectin safety and efficacy for the treatment of COVID-19. And so, the question has been raised. What will it take to get this incredibly influential panel to change the recommendation? Well, the answer almost certainly will be produce more positive data from better designed, sufficient powered clinical trials. And so, as always, we here at Trial Site News will continue to cover this story and others related to it as they develop. And that, my friends, brings this episode to a close. As always, thank you so much for joining us today. From Trial Site News, I'm Adrian, and this has been an episode of Beyond the Roundup. We'll see you all next time.